Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to uh, the YouTube channel. Um, I'm just waiting for, for Avi to join me. Um, I actually made a slight mistake and I'll, I'll hold my hands up to it. I didn't realize that daylight savings had changed two days ago in, in New York. And so I got a message from Avi an hour ago saying I'm, I'm waiting on StreamYard. So I ran up to my office, spoke to him and he graciously said, no problem, I'll come back in an hour. So He's due, due any moment. So, um, yeah, before we start, though, I'll just say um, thank you to everybody watching live on YouTube. Anybody watching this late today on YouTube, thank you so much. And thank you to anybody listening to this on the Anomalous Podcast Network. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, for anybody that is here live, if we could just keep the, the chat room mature and uh, let's not get into any arguments or anything, which I'm sure sure won't happen. If you do have a question that you'd like to, me to, to possibly ask at the end of the interview for Avi, if you could leave that in capital letters, um, that should help me see it. I've got so much going on in front of me. Um, that would be great. So, yeah, um, I see some questions already coming in. And, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make a note of them, but they may actually conflict with some of the ones that I've already got. So, so that's cool. Um, let's see who we got here. Hey, guys, Lara, Joss, Arno, Arna, Andre. K Alexander, Benji, my brother. Thank you. Thank you guys for all being here. Anonymous Rex, UAP experiences, Steph. Thank you so much, guys. Um, what else can we talk about until uh, Professor gets here? Yorne, how's it going? Um, for anybody that's not aware, I recently made a trip to Colombia to film a documentary series called Phenomenology. You can now go and subscribe to the YouTube channel. We have a trailer up. We have a Rough Cuts video up already as well. The uh, The season starts on May the 1st. So uh, that'll be episode one. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited for everybody to see what we did out there. Um, it's going to be great. I really hope you enjoy it. Um, Benji, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ron. I really appreciate that. Um, that's very, very kind. Well, guys, my guest is here, so I'm just going to give him a uh, an introduction, and then we'll bring him on and get this show on the road. So, Avi Loeb uh, is the Frank B. Baird Jr. Professor of Science at Harvard University and best-selling author. Um, he received a PhD in physics from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel at age 24, and he led the first international project supported by the Strategic Defense Initiative and was subsequently a long-term member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. He's written eight books on a wide range of topics, including Black Holes, The First Stars, The Search for Extraterrestrial Life, and The Future of the Universe. He is the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation within the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and also serves as the head of the Galileo Project. He had been the longest serving chair of Harvard's Department of Astronomy and the founding director of Harvard's Black Hole Initiative. He is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Physical Society, and the International Academy of Astronautics. He is a former member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology at the White House, a former chair of the Board on Physics and Astronomy of the National Academics, uh, sorry, National Academies, and a current member of the Advisory Board for Einstein, Visualize the Impossible of the Hebrew University. He also chairs the advisory committee for the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative and serves as the science theory director for all initiatives of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. In 2012, Time magazine selected Loeb as one of the 25 most influential people in space. And in 2020, he was selected among the 14 most inspiring is Israelis of the last decade. Please uh, welcome Avi Loeb. Avi, how are you? I'm doing great. Nice to see you, Vinny. Um, I have to apologize for the mistake I made earlier with regards to the time zone difference. Oh, no. Time is relative, according to Einstein. Don't <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I, I'm a, I appreciate you being here. It really means a lot to me. It's good to see you. Um, so I'll try not to keep you too long. So we'll jump straight into it. Um, so, so basically, we're here mainly to talk about the Galileo project. Um, it's been probably getting on for around a year now since you you announced it and you've built this strong research team advisory board and a large affiliate group featuring many professionals and scientists but during this first almost year have you 
have the conversations in the halls of Harvard and elsewhere, have you felt the stigma and taboo lift at all surrounding this topic? Um, well, a bit, I should say. Um, first of all, uh, by now we have more than 100 scientists engaged in the Galileo project. It was announced uh, only um, eight months ago uh, okay. or so, uh, seven months ago. And uh, actually, we, we are planning uh, in the summer, it was announced in, in, at the end of July 2021. So um, exactly a year uh, later, we are planning to have the first uh, in-person meeting of the Galileo project. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, by then, we hope to have the first telescope system on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory and have some data and some analysis of our artificial intelligence algorithms uh, just to demonstrate that uh, we can take a video of the sky in different wavelengths, infrared, visible light, uh, radio, and also audio. Uh, so basically, make a movie of the sky and analyze it uh, so that um, once we are happy with this telescope system, we can make copies of it and make it put it in different locations. And I really hope that this first in-person meeting where we will demonstrate the, the fact that the telescope works, um, that uh, that would uh, provide a, a brainstorming session where all members of the Galileo project will think ahead about the next phase and starting to collect data because it's all about getting evidence. You see, the, the thing that defines the Galileo project is that we're not giving up on exotic explanations. The scientific community basically uh, attempts to interpret anything seen on the sky as being natural without considering other options. And we are allowing other options to be possible it's not as if we have a prejudice or, um, you know, a, a, a wishful thinking or anything. It's just that we are willing to follow the data. Let the telescopes guide us. Because that's the lesson that we learned from Galileo Galilei. Four centuries ago, he was telling the philosophers, look through my telescope. And they said, no, we know that uh, the sun moves around the earth. There is no point in doing that. And not only that, they didn't want others to listen to this uh, first uh, scientist of modern science and they put him in house arrest and today they would have cancelled him on social media so we learned an important lesson that you know nowadays when we launch a, a, a rocket or a spacecraft that uh, we want uh, uh, it to reach uh, mars for example you know we don't pay attention to the ideas of these philosophers they would have gotten it wrong because they thought that mars moves around the earth so reality is whatever it is, irrespective of how popular it is, and to find the reality that we live in, the actual reality, not the metaverse when you put goggles on your head and you imagine something else, uh, but the actual reality that we all share to learn about it with all its pimples. You know, it's just like, you know, people prefer to put makeup on reality so that we don't see uh, the things that are not so pleasant for us, that like we are not at the center of the universe. You know, that's not so pleasant. We would rather be at the center uh, we would rather be the only intelligent species that ever existed since the Big Bang. But let's give up on that uh, uh, presumption. Let's uh, just look at the universe the way it is, without makeup, just using our telescopes. That's the lesson we learned from Galileo. Because sometimes, you know, the evidence is not flattering to us. And we better know it so that we can accommodate uh, to whatever the reality is. And, you know, I love reality... Uh, the way it is. I don't need it to have makeup. I don't need it to please my wishes. I just want to see it the way it is. I'm in love with it the way it is. And, you know, when you are in love with something or someone, you want to learn everything about it, you know? So if there is a smarter kid on our block, so be it. Let, let's learn about him it or her or it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, um, the early plans and the processes that you were going to implement were, were looking at objects out in sort of interstellar space and also things a lot closer to home. Um, so, so let's just talk about the, the things that are a bit further afield. With the equipment that you plan on using to look out outwards, is this new equipment that is being created specifically for the project? Yes. Um, so astronomers look at the sky all the time, right? But they're focusing on distant sources of light. And if a bird flies above, above the telescope, they simply ignore it. If they see a drone, they ignore it. 
So anything moving close to the telescope is being ignored. Also, you know, only recently over the past decade, we built a, a telescope that can survey the sky and detect an object the size of a football field. Uh, it's, it's the Panstars survey telescope. And it indeed discovered an object the size of a football field that came from outside the solar system. But that object didn't look like the typical rock that we see within the solar system. It didn't look like a comet. It did not evaporate, it did not produce a cometary tail, and it didn't look like a, an asteroid in the sense that it was pushed away from the sun without any rocket effect, without evaporation. So, so it looked strange. And by the way, NASA never launched a football, a football field size spacecraft. Um, so there might be many more smaller objects that might some of which might be artificial may not be rocks and so the point is only over the past decade there was a survey telescope that could see based on the reflected sunlight objects of a size of a football field so we might be missing a lot of them and they might be passing fast so um so but also close to earth uh you know it's military personnel that reported these unidentified objects and they were not really equipped with scientific instrumentation and astronomers were not looking close to us. You know, of course, people were monitoring meteors. These are rocks falling from the sky and burning up in the atmosphere, but they're extremely rare and much rarer than the frequency of those unidentified objects that the military was reporting about. So, so there is a need to build uh, new observing systems. And what we are constructing is new in the sense that uh, you know, we, we will have uh, cameras that monitor the entire sky, not just a small portion of the sky, the way usually astronomy is done, but the entire sky all the time in both infrared and visible light. The infrared is important because if you have a warm object at night, you can still see it from the emission. But uh, during daytime, you can see the reflection of sunlight from anything. And so we have both and also radio waves, and uh, we also ha will have a magnetometer and the audio system. And um, all together, it's a new system, even though the components can be bought off the shelf. You know, it's, it's just putting it together and also equipping it with the computing system that can uh, do the identification of what we see in the sky in terms of, you know, is it an object that we recognize, like a drone or a bird? In those cases, even though it sounds, you know, interesting to some people, you know, zoologists are interested in birds, I will be glad to transfer any high-resolution image of a bird to zoologists. You know, for us, it's not so interesting. It just We just want to identify whether what we're seeing is, is something known. And if we see a drone that says, made in China, made in Russia, you know, then... Of course, uh, there are people in uh, Washington, D.C. that are very interested. And we'd be glad to transfer that data to them. For us, it's as boring, I should say. <laughs> now, it's possible that everything we would see will end up in these categories, either, either natural, you know, bird, lightning, uh, meteor, all kinds of natural phenomena, or human-made objects, including satellites, including, you know, um, airplanes, drones, anything that, uh, or a balloon, weather balloon, or whatever. If it ends up being uh, just these two cat categories, um, you know, so be it. It's also an important service uh, that the Galileo uh, project uh, is making because at least the government is puzzled by some of the things that the military personnel saw. And, you know, the government has, uh, I would assume, uh, excellent data uh, because they have to monitor the sky. So if the government is puzzled and we just explain it in terms of known things, I think it's an important service that the scientific community needs to make rather than ridicule and say everything is natural. And if there is something else that is not from this earth, that is not a meteor, not a rock, not a natural thing, then let's uh, see what it is. I mean, we shouldn't make any assumptions uh, if, if it behaves in ways that cannot be replicated by our technologies if it looks very different uh, than natural objects because it has screws and bolts on it and some buttons that you can in principle press let's figure out what it is you know i'm just like at that point i would be like a kid in a candy store <laughs> i would like to press any button that they see 
<laughs> That's great. And, and would any of these objects that you mentioned, if it did come down to genuinely being something anomalous, is, has that been, have you got systems in place that are utilizing artificial intelligence to, you know, to brush away all the, all the things that we know? And then what is the actual analysis process like before you can finally confirm that it's a genuine anomaly? Yes, exactly. That is our approach would be the approach that Sherlock Holmes adapted, you know, in, in, the, the fictional uh, detective. Um, he basically said that you put all possibilities on the table and then you rule them out by the evidence, okay? And whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Now, it's possible that what will remain would be something that we are familiar with, okay? That's possible. Everything we look at will appear to be either natural or human-made. It's a possibility. But what I'm saying is, at least the government uh, currently is puzzled. So we will help them figure it out. And the head of NASA, Bill Nelson, was uh, saying back when the director of national intelligence, Avril Haines, delivered the report to Congress uh, about uh, seven, eight months ago, he was saying uh, that scientists should engage and figure out what these things are. And that's exactly what we are doing. We are using the scientific method, which was pioneered by Galileo. So if he were alive today, I would have made him a honorary member of the Galileo project. And are you having conversations with people like Bill Nelson or other members of NASA? You know, are you engaging with them and, and liaising with them uh, with regards to helping with the project at all? Well, at the moment, uh, we are not engaged with any government uh, organization. Uh, part of this is because we don't want to analyze uh, classified data because that would yeah. limit our ability to uh, share freely what we know uh, with other scientists. Um, so at the moment, there are no collaborations. But, you know, we shall see if anything else comes along. Uh, for example, there would be this new office in government that will start operations in June 2022, uh, signed into law by President Biden. And uh, it's possible they would declassify some data, and we will be really interested in looking at that. Um, the other thing I should say is uh, I was told by a number of members of the Galileo project that they are really thrilled to be engaged in collecting new data because, you know, for many years they were interested in the subject. But uh, they didn't have this uh, uh, community of people that are like-minded. And uh, by announcing the Galileo project, I basically allowed this group of people to speak freely. And if you think about it, that's an elementary right, uh, an elementary ingredient of the scientific process. So by ridiculing the subject and stigmatizing it, you know, uh, the scientific community is basically taking it out of the scientific process. Now think about the dark matter. We don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. And people suggested over the past 40, 50 years that there may be this type of particle, maybe another type of particle is the dark matter. We don't know what it is. And they were sort of suggesting various possibilities. And I came from that community. You know, I worked uh, on cosmology throughout the first uh, couple of a uh, few decades of my career and that was pretty much the mentality you you it was completely legitimate to speculate or suggest the uh, possibilities for the dark matter since we don't know what it is and it can motivate experiments and over the past uh, 40 years there were experiments funded at billions of dollars altogether the, the latest is the large hadron collider that uh, cost 10 billion dollars and was looking for supersymmetric particles that could potentially make the dark, the lightest among them could make the dark matter. We haven't found it. So think about uh, if some people within the scientific community would say, well, supersymmetry was not found yet. And therefore they would ridicule that idea. They would say not only that it doesn't make much sense since we haven't seen mm -hmm. any sign of supersymmetry, but anyone that engages with that uh, is a crackpot or should be stigmatized. This should not be even studied because we have no extraordinary evidence for supersymmetry. Therefore, supersymmetric particles cannot make the dark matter. Therefore, we should not invest any funds in the search for supersymmetric particles. 
What would we then do? We would not build the Large Hadron Collider. We would not search for the most popular supersymmetric you know, for, uh, model for the dark matter. And uh, as a result, we would not know if it is <laughs> that particle or maybe something else. But instead, we engaged in the search. We didn't find it. So we learned something. Now, in retrospect, was it a waste of money? Should have, you know, should we have avoided it because there was no extraordinary evidence for supersymmetry? The answer is no. That's the scientific process. That's the way things should be done. So, you know, in the case of unidentified objects or objects like Oumuamua that did not look like the rocks we are used to, what's the problem in allowing for the possibility that we might find a plastic bottle one day from another civilization? I mean, after all, we sent spacecraft to space and it's not such a speculation to imagine someone else doing it a billion years ago because a lot of stars formed billions of years before the sun and they have planets like the Earth around them. So... Just imagine us elsewhere a billion years ago. That's all. And sending spacecraft. And so that's not a great speculation. I, I would argue that it's more down to earth, so to speak, compared to the, the suggestion that dark matter is super a supersymmetric particle. Nevertheless, it's stigmatized, ridiculed. And people claim it's extraordinary of us to even consider that. And I say extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding if we had billions of dollars dedicated to the search for equipment from other civilizations in space over 40 years and we would not find anything then we would be exactly at the same point as the search for supersymmetric particles the dark matter okay we would be at the same point where we are now in the context of the dark matter search so why should the search for equipment from other civilizations be ridiculed in advance. This is not the scientific method. No, not at all. Um, now, you mentioned in there Amuamua. Um, one thing that I was really wanting to ask was, in the time that Amuamua was, was visible through the telescopes, did you do all the analysis that you wanted to do in the time it was there? Or, or did it disappear before you, know, you had the chance to do uh, all the studies? definitely disappeared before we had a chance because, right. uh, you know, there were unusual anomalies about uh, Oumuamua, things that did not conform with objects we've seen before. I mean, the first was that it uh, changed its uh, brightness by a factor of 10 uh, as it was tumbling. And uh, that's unusual. It meant that it has an extreme shape. Usually we see uh, variations but up to a factor of three from asteroids. Um, and also that it was pushed away from the sun uh, by some mysterious force, even though it didn't have a cometary tail. Now, this last bit of uh, anomaly was reported about eight months after the object was discovered. And uh, so it was reported in June 2018. And by January 2018, uh, about five months earlier, the object was already too faint for us to see with our telescopes. So by the time we realized that it's so unusual, it was too late. It's sort of like going on a date and realizing the person you went out with is really remarkable and interesting only after that person left. And then you have to find another person like that one. Uh, and so, you know, the problem with Oumuamua by now, it's millions of times fainter than it was close to us. And it's simply because an object gets gets uh, fainter inversely with distance to the fourth power uh, so, uh, relative to the sun. And so uh, it get, these objects get really faint quickly as they move away. And uh, we need to catch them when they are passing near us. And in fact, we want to rendezvous with the next Oumuamua. It's sort of like planning on a, dating the next Oumuamua. And uh, it's a very expensive date, I, I, I should <laughs> tell you, because... If we will, I mean, the best way to figure out its nature would be to send a camera very close to it so we can get a high resolution image of it. I mean, we could also learn more about it with the James Webb Space Telescope from a distance. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, the James Webb Space Telescope is much better than the Hubble Space Telescope that we had when we looked at Oumuamua because uh, the JWST is at the Lagrange point two, you know, L2 which is quite far from Earth, okay? 
And if we look at the next Oumuamua from Earth and from JWST, we are looking at it from two different directions, significantly different directions. The Hubble Space Telescope was very close to Earth, so it was almost the same viewing angle. But if you look at an object from different directions, you can track its motion in three dimensions extremely well because you are seeing it from two directions. So you can cross the cross reference the observations and figure out the trajectory in three dimensions to a high precision. That would give us a very good sense about whether it's being pushed by something other than evaporation. Okay. And moreover, you can observe it with a much bigger telescope because uh, the JWST is three times bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope. So 10 times the collecting area, also looking at the infrared. So it can potentially see the emission from the object, can figure out its temperature uh, and the, maybe the reflectance, take a spectrum of it. So figure out the composition of the surface. A lot of things that even without coming close to the object, you can figure out. So that's the advantage of having JWST. And the other advantage we have is that instead of PANSTARS, the telescope that discovered Oumuamua, there will be another um, survey telescope called the Vera Rubin Observatory that um, will be much more sensitive, bigger telescope, uh, and therefore much more sensitive that will start operations in about a year and a half and uh, will be able to find many more objects like Oumuamua at larger distances. So if we see them, an object like that coming towards us, we can send a spacecraft equipped with a camera that will rendezvous it along its path. And you need to come as close as a thousand kilometers to such an object in order to get a high resolution image. And that's possible. Now, that is part of the Galileo project. So aside from looking at unidentified objects close to Earth, we are also engaged in designing a mission that will rendezvous with the next Oumuamua, and such a mission is quite expensive. You know, it's half a, a billion dollars at least. Uh, and so it's a very expensive date. Just think <laughs> about it go, <laughs> going on a date. This is an expensive date. So you have to make sure that the object you are rendezvousing with is worth the money because you don't want to go there and see, you know, a rock. That would be disappointing. I mean, it would be interesting to examine the rock, but we've seen a lot of rocks before. So, um, you know, for example, Osiris Rex, this mission from um, that, that landed on, on the asteroid Bennu, took a high resolution image of the surface. It looked like a rock with, you know, pebbles and stuff on it. It's sort of like dirt, you know, and it collected some of this dirt. It will bring it back to Earth within a year. But that's not as thrilling as landing on a spacecraft, you know, like figuring out this spacecraft has a label. The label says made on exoplanet Y and <laughs> there are some buttons on it. Maybe we can navigate it. So anyway, um, so we want to be, to be sure that the object we are rendezvousing with is unusual, at least looking like Oumuamua and then send that mission. And so we are planning that mission, but also we have to prepare for finding such objects. So designing the software that will identify Oumuamua-like objects uh, from the pipeline of data that comes from uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory. Yeah. Well, hypothetically speaking, if tomorrow maybe one of the telescopes in Chile or Hawaii suddenly alerted you that they've spotted an object that's coming in that's similar and you're not ready or prepared to you know roll out all the equipment yet do you have like um things in place to, to 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 get there would do you have connections with nasa where you can say can we utilize the james webb and turn it and, and look for this thing like what would you do if it happened tomorrow oh definitely use all the telescopes available and you know given that my book was published a year ago and um, um there was a huge amount of interest, uh, both in the public, but also in the scientific community. A lot of uh, people trying to push back. I, you know, I would imagine that every telescope would look at this object. Okay, just because the scientists would like to prove that it's a hydrogen iceberg or a nitrogen iceberg or a cloud of dust particles if it's not artificial, and that's perfectly fine. I'm all for it. If we discover that this object is a rock of a type that we've never seen before, like was suggested by the mainstream. Uh, then we learn something new. We learn that there are nurseries that make objects that the solar system doesn't, or at least we didn't see in the solar system, okay? 
And so we will learn something new no matter what. And I hope that in trying to just prove that it's natural, but of a type that we've never seen before, the scientists will collect so much data that we will definitely have a better clue about the nature of that object, as long as it doesn't look like a comet, a regular comet, you know, because sure. the second the interstellar object that was discovered was Borisov, and that was, that looked like a comet. So scientists came to me and said, well, this second one looks like a regular comet, so doesn't it convince you that Oumuamua was natural? And I said, well, if you go on the beach and you, you see a plastic bottle and then you see a rock, you know, it doesn't make the plastic bottle a rock. And um, on the contrary, the fact that uh, Borisov looked so close to a regular comet makes Oumuamua unusual. I should say, uh, here is a, an interesting scoop for you. Uh, that, um, um, about um, three years ago, uh, I was interviewed about um, a meteor that was found uh, close to... Um, Kamchatka, um, uh, and uh, um, in in trying to learn uh, about more more information about this meteor, um, I um, opened up you know on the internet various websites related to meteors, and I realized that there is there is a catalog of meteors and uh, that has data about the speed by which they enter the atmosphere. Okay, so meteors are just usually they they are a rock, you know that enters the atmosphere and burns up and you see the light. So you basically you are using the atmosphere as a detector of an object. It's very different from looking uh, at the reflected sunlight. So for the reflected sunlight, as I said, you can only see uh, right now objects as big as a football field within the orbit of the Earth around the sun, unless they come extremely close. But with an object that burns in the atmosphere, it creates its own light. There is a fireball. So you can see objects the size of a person, no problem, okay? And that was this um, this meteor, and but then there is a catalog, and so I approached uh, as soon after the interview was over. It was a radio interview. I approached my um, student, undergraduate student, and I said, "Why don't you check this catalog, and uh, you know, and figure out whether the fastest meteors that were identified." Any of them, if you go back in time, uh, you can figure out whether they came from outside the solar system. If they moved fast enough, they cannot be bound to the sun. Okay? Right. So he went to the first object that was the fastest. Turned out that this one was just a head-on collision with Earth. So it wasn't moving really uh, fast relative to the sun. It was just moving opposite to the Earth. So the Earth collided with it at the high speed, relative speed. He then he went to the second object. Uh, and for that, he found definitely, you know, it came from outside the solar system. It was moving at 40 kilometers per second, far away from the sun. And uh, my student, Amir Siraj, and myself, uh, we wrote immediately a paper that we submitted for publication within a few days, saying, actually, this is a meteor from 2014, the second right on the list from 2014, January 2014. So it's almost four years before Oumuamua was discovered. And it is, it seems to be of interstellar origin. So we said, here is an object, the first interstellar meteor. And, and by the way, interstellar dust was detected on Earth before. I mean, tiny particles. This is just a human size object. So it's big. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you think about CubeSats or there are many more CubeSats that NASA uh, or, or objects the size of a person that NASA launched to space than the big spacecraft, right? So you expect objects like that to be much more common than Oumuamua-like objects, even if they're artificial, you know, you expect. So at any event, uh, we don't know the nature of this meteor. So we submitted the paper just saying the first interstellar meteor. And uh, the referees, the reviewers of the paper said, no, this paper should be rejected, not published, because uh, the data in that catalog was government-owned. You know, it, got the, it was government data. And the error bars were not reported because the government doesn't want to uh, provide information about how good the sensors that the government yeah. is using are. So we said, look, 
you know, you don't trust the government, but the government needs to know whether a ballistic missile gets to Boston or, or New York City. So they really have very good instrumentation. They won't, you know, but the referee said, no way, I don't believe the government. The government could be wrong and therefore the paper should not be published. So then I approached some people that uh, tried to help us uh, uh, from behind the, fe the, the fence, so to speak. Uh, and, um, you know, it took many years, uh, but um, I just heard recently that um, uh, indeed the, there is um, hopefully a document about to be sent uh, to us that will um, definitely state that this object uh, was interstellar. So, uh, it, well, there are two things to take from this story. First of all, Umumu is not the first, okay? We have no. interstellar meteors that we can look for. And the advantage of that is if anything remains from the meteor that lands on the ground, you know, we can put our hands on it. So it's possible most of the interstellar objects would be rocks, but it's also possible that one every now and uh, every once in a while, one of the interstellar objects will not be a rock. And that's great, you know, because we don't need to send anything to space. Space sends things to us, <laughs> okay? Um, and it could be even possible to search for the whatever debris was left over of that, that meteor from 2014 in, near Papua New, New Guinea. That's where it entered the ocean. Uh, at any event, um, the second lesson to learn is how conservative the scientific community is because the referees were not willing to consider this paper for publication. And, you know, what would be the harm from such a, paper being published like why would that be so so um so much pushed against and uh the only way i can think of it you know their their reviewers were experts in this field and they were not part of the discovery of this of this meteor and they would try to block it as much as possible because you know why would someone else get credit for that discovery. Now, by claiming the government is, does not know what they're doing, you know, that, that's an easy claim to make because yeah. unfortunately, a lot of the information is hidden. Um, but um, in this case, I hope that very soon we'll be able to show publicly that indeed this uh, data was good enough for us to claim that this is an interstellar meteor. So it took a few years in the making to get the government out. That's why I'm not seeking classified data. You know, if the government will release or declassify existing data, that would be fantastic. But otherwise, the process of declassification is so tedious yeah. that uh, it's better to get our, you know, new data from our new telescope systems because the sky is not classified. No, absolutely. And then you don't have anybody else to answer to either, which uh, which would be be great. I um, mean, and you... this is one aspect of it. But another is, suppose you know something that is classified and, and you're not speaking about it, but then you discover something similar using the telescope systems. Then you have a conflict because, you know, someone could argue that the reason you interpreted that new thing as this or that is based on what you already knew that looked similar to this on, or that. So there is also that part that you're not, um, you know, the, the, it's complicated because you're you are now entangled in some prior knowledge that you're not supposed to talk about. So it's much simpler if you act like a kid. You know, a kid doesn't the kid doesn't care. You know, adults always have a baggage. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to keep maintain my childhood uh, approach as much as possible, not have a baggage. I think a lot of people should 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 follow suit and and try try that out themselves, me me included. Um, now, in that uh, conversation part there, you mentioned sensor systems and the government and that. Now, one thing that we know about, or we I say we know, we we assume or we hypothesize when it comes to UAP is that they can manipulate gravity. Now, is there any way that you will be implementing any any systems that will monitor sort of gravity waves or anything like that to see if there are any objects, you know? visible in that respect yeah so first i should explain the perspective i'm coming from i'm a physicist you know and the laws of physics that we use um routinely in physics work exceptionally well okay in the sense that 
you know, um, to find deviations from the laws of physics that we routinely use, you know, wins you a Nobel Prize, even if the deviation is tiny. And a lot of people are working really hard to see any slight hint of a deviation, it's called an anomaly, relative to the established laws of quantum mechanics and gravity that we, we all know. So if we find any evidence for a deviation from the known laws of physics, that would be of much bigger impact because it would affect the universe at large, you know, because the laws of physics apply everywhere. They don't just apply to UAP. So if a UAP shows a deviation from the laws of physics, it's dramatic because it means that anywhere in the universe you can deviate in the same way, okay? So yeah. that, I would argue, is only, you know, if we cannot explain what we see in terms of the known laws of physics, and that should be left out of the first approach to any phenomena we see. So if you see something really weird, you need to understand, is it malfunction of the instruments? Okay, is it yeah. an optical illusion? There, there could be lots of possibilities. Uh, and only once you rule them out, you should even consider the possibility of, because that would be of much grander scope, you know. And, uh, so we should be careful before we get there to make sure that we exhausted all other possibilities. Now, with respect to gravity waves, I should say, you know, based, again, I'm speaking about what we know from the rest of experimental physics. You know, to detect gravity waves, the LIGO experiment had to, to build very sensitive detectors uh, that, um, you know, can detect a, a tiny, tiny deviation, you know, across, uh, across a distance uh, of, let's say, five kilometers or so, the deviation is smaller than the size of the nucleus of an atom. You know, it's tiny. Um, and, um, and that was produced by, uh, you know, that kind of a deviation that won them the Nobel Prize. because They detected it in, in 2015. That was produced by the collision of two black holes at the edge of the universe. And black holes represent the most extreme structures of space and time uh, in the sense that, you know, when you get into a black hole, you cannot get out of it. Uh, it's sort of like the ultimate prison uh, <laughs> just because space and time confine you and you are doomed to be torn apart when you fall to the center of the black hole. I once described it because I was invited to uh, the kindergarten where my daughters were and they asked me to speak about black holes and of course, my wife said it's your duty to your daughters to speak in front of the class about it. So I started speaking about what happens to an astronaut when the astronaut falls into a black hole. And at, at some point, the teacher stopped me and said, please don't describe it in more details because the kids <laughs> have nightmares. So because, you know, the human body basically gets torn apart. There, there is no escape from that. So imagine those extremes structures of spa curved space and time that collide they create a storm of space and time near them like every like if you had a clock you would see the clock you know changing the dial changes by order unity like it shows one time and then a, a completely different time later on and so the rate by which time is ticking is changing by order unity relative to an observer far away close to the collision site and that is a, an extremely powerful change in the curvature of space and time locally. And that uh, gets radiated away as gravitational waves. Okay, so it's just like dropping a stone uh, on the surface of a pond. So close to where the stone hit the pond, you get large amplitude waves, but then they die out as they move away. Mm -hmm. So we detect it far away, you know, as a tiny deviation. Now, you're asking about a UAP producing gravitation waves. Well... To do that, you need it to be sort of like a black hole for us to be able to detect it. It needs to be a huge amount of mass. But we would see, actually, if it was a huge amount of mass concentrated in a small region, it would actually affect us through Newton's law of gravity. Forget about Einstein's theory of general relativity, these waves. You would actually sense it, the pull from something very concentrated with a lot of energy, okay? The gravitational pull just as a result of Newtonian uh, law of gravity, you know, you would feel it. 
And, and Newton's law of gravity is a consequence of Einstein's equations, okay? So, so they are both consistent with each other. So my point is, we would notice it just because we would be pulled gravitationally long before we would detect the gravitational waves. So, so according to the standard description of gravity that we see, you know, throughout the universe, we see the universe expanding according to that, to Einstein's equations. According to that, you know, there is no major deviation uh, that we noticed. Uh, tests of Einstein's theory of gravity are all in perfect agreement with his equations. So according to that, you would first feel the effect of new, you know, Newtonian gravity long before you would feel the effects of gravitational waves. And um, therefore, I, you know, we don't need to put LIGO uh, as part of our uh, detector system. And also, it's a, a very, com you know, this experiment costs $1.1 billion to the National Science Foundation. We don't want, you know, if we had the billion dollars, we make, we would make better use of it to look for other kinds of signals. Um, now, people often talk about, you know, uh, modifications of gravity, about extra dimensions. Once again, these are uh, ideas to which we don't have any evidence from existing data, okay? And it's possible. I'm saying, you know, I, we cannot rule it out and perhaps we should look for that uh, as anomalies. But the first approach should be to interpret whatever we see using the laws of physics, because that's the way science is done. And only when you're pushed with your back to the wall, you can't really explain what you see. Then you should go in that direction. And that, you know, people invest billions of dollars to figure out any deviations from what we know. You know, the Large Hadron Collider is an example for that. Um, and we don't find very often deviations. It's, it's quite rare. Uh, and that's why Nobel Prizes are not easy to get by, you know, you really need to discover something new. Uh, so I would say, let's wait and see what the data tells us. Again, I am not excluding that, but I'm sure. saying it would be of major importance to describing the universe if we ever find it a new, you know, a, a deviation from what we know in physics. Yeah. And now before before we go, is it okay if I just um, read out some questions that we've had here in the oh, chat? Sure, sure. And on I, social I think, media. I'll be short, uh, if, if you want to ask quick questions, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. sure. Um, I, mean, I suppose the main question that I've been getting is, after all of this data is collected and you can say that this is a genuine photograph of something anomalous, when does the public get to see the data or oh, the image? So the only delay would be caused by us uh, within the Galileo project trying to make sure that, you know, there is no artifact in the data, that it's not... Um, some malfunction of the instrument to make sure that we trust the data. Uh, and that often takes a few months, you know, at most, uh, just to make sure the data, you know, we understand that how the data was collected and uh, that there is no bug in the way it was analyzed. Then we put out a scientific uh, paper about it and we release it to the public. So it will all be open. The, the analysis will be transparent. The only delay is because we want to make sure that, you know, we are not uh, crying wolf when, it's uh, it's actually something else. Yeah. Uh, one final question: um, Will there be a capability for normal people to to donate their sort of CPU processing power to help with analyzing data, like they used to do with SETI back in the back in the early days? Well, it's a possibility. Um, for now, the CPU is not an issue for us. It's not like um, I mean, we can deal with it with the computer right. systems that we can purchase. So, really, the the main uh, challenge is to get enough money that we can build many copies of those telescope systems, you see. And uh, when we estimate, based on the reported rate of UAP, when we estimate how many telescope systems we need, it's, you know, it would be good to, to, to have tens of millions of dollars just to have enough telescope systems. So $100 million would definitely allow us to, to get the job done. And, and by the way, $100 million is not... A lot of money for a scientific project, especially dealing with a question that is of so much interest to the public. So my hope is that there would be a wealthy donor that will decide that this is indeed a priority, uh, that the public deserves to know the answer, that you know we will definitely do a honest job. We will make sure that everything is open and transparent and according to the scientific method. And so um, if there will be a wealthy donor that will be excited and, I'm, you know, I'm working on that, then um, we will get the job done within a few years. I mean, this will not take long as long as we have the funding. 
Yeah, sure. I really do hope that that you find the funding that you need. For anybody that happens to be listening or watching, if you have any millions lying around, there is a link in the description to directly go to the donation page on the Galileo Project website, on the Harvard website. But Avi, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. I won't keep you any longer. To everybody listening and watching, thank you so much for joining us, and I will see you all very soon. So thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you, Vin. Thank you. Bye-bye now.